good shepherd everywhere I go he knows Baba he is my savior I will follow where he goes Jesus loves me finds me cares for me watches saves me leads back home Good morning and welcome to our service of worship this morning at Bojaffrey. Um, today we've moved on to John 10 where Jesus famously says, I am the good shepherd. Um, but actually when he says that, he's resonating with, a, with an image that uh, the people would have recognised because the Bible is full of shepherds. All the way back in Genesis we've got Abel, the son of Adam and Eve, who was a tender of sheep. You've got Jacob who became known as Israel, who uh, also tended sheep for his uncle Laban. Moses became a shepherd um, when he left Egypt before he came back to lead the people out of Egypt. King David famously was a shepherd, wrote the the 23rd Psalm, um, the Lord is my shepherd. The prophet Amos was a shepherd as well. And not just that, but also the prophets quite often used the imagery of shepherds and sheep to talk about uh, leaders of people and the people of Israel themselves. But this is what God says 
uh, in Ezekiel 34. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries. And I will bring them into their own land. I will pass to them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines and in all the settlements in the land. I will tend them in good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land. And there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. So, come, all you are scattered, strayed, injured and weak. The shepherd calls you back. Now let's sing, The Lord's My Shepherd. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. And I will trust in you. And I will trust in you. For your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will. my ways in righteousness, and He anoints my head with oil, and my cup it overflows with joy. I feast on His I will trust in Jesus, and I will trust in Jesus, for your endless mercy follows me, your goodness will
Let's continue our worship now as we join together in prayer and as we, uh, as we begin, we will start with a moment of silence to, to rest in God's presence um, and to trust him for this time. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you for that picture of the Good Shepherd. Thank you that we could know that you trust, that we can trust in you because you love us and care for us. Pray now that we would be able to come into a place of rest, of clear waters, of good grazing, that we would meet with you this morning, that we would be able to honour you and praise you as the Good Shepherd, that we would hear your voice as your sheep should, we would recognise your voice and heed your voice this morning. And yet, Father, we know that we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep, We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have broken your laws. We've left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But you have mercy upon us. As we confess our faults to you, God, spare us, restore us, according to the promises that were made to us by Christ Jesus. And grant, Lord, from here on that we would live lives of obedience and righteousness, that we would heed your words and follow that we would not stray in your good mercies. Thank you for all that you have promised and all that you have done for us. Come and be with us. And let us join together as those who follow the Good Shepherd in the words that he taught his disciples, his sheep, as the Good Shepherd, as we say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, good morning. Um, As Ben has said, we're thinking about Jesus' words, I am the good shepherd. But before we think about that a little bit more, um, here is a picture of a dog. Now, it's not any old dog. This is, her name is Olive. And don't think many of you have met her, but she is our guide dog puppy we have. She's about 18 months old, and she looks amazing, and she is amazing. But do you think that she is obedient, like she's good at listening to the whistle and our voice and when we call her, or do you think she's disobedient? I wonder. 
Looks like butter wouldn't melt, melt in her mouth there, doesn't it? Looks like she'd be so kind and loving, and she is. Well, she's got a habit of running off. She really does. And we were out a walk a couple of weeks ago, and she ran off for miles and disappeared. And I've got to admit, I was just a wee bit frustrated, just a little bit, at the way Olive was. And Jesus, when he talks about being the good shepherd, he says that the sheep, that's us, he says the sheep listen to his voice as the good shepherd. We follow him and we know his voice and we can tell his voice. And I have another question for you to think about, and we'll answer that in a minute or so, but feel free to chat it in. It's like Jesus is saying that the sheep listen to the shepherd's voice, and they don't listen to other voices. They learn to ignore the other voices. Do you think that's right? Do you think really sheep go like Olive doesn't do and go to the shepherd's voice? Or are sheep a bit like Olive and just run off, even when you're calling her back and trying to keep her safe? Feel free to chat that in. What do you think? Do sheep listen to the shepherd's voice? Do they really listen to the shepherd's voice? We'll answer that question um, in a wee minute. But now, let's watch a short video that tells us the story of the good shepherd that Jesus told us. One day, a flock of sheep was eating green, green grass, jumping and playing in the beautiful pasture they called home. The sheep loved their home, and they knew they had a good, loving shepherd. Their favorite part of the whole day was when the shepherd called to them. They knew his voice and ran to him because they knew he loved them and took care of them. Whenever the shepherd called, they came running. Wherever he led, they followed. They just wanted to be close to him. One day, an evil robber climbed over the fence to their pasture. He was looking for sheep just like them to take far, far away. The sheep didn't see him. They weren't even looking. They were just eating their green, green grass, jumping and playing in the beautiful pasture they called home. They knew their shepherd would call them at any moment, and they couldn't wait. Just then, the robber called. Sheep, oh sheep, come to me. The sheep looked up in fear. What was this? Where was that strange voice coming from? They didn't know, but they did know one thing. That wasn't their shepherd's voice. So they ran away from the robber. They ran and they ran and they ran. And no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't catch them. Jesus is the good shepherd. When we pray, we get to know his voice. So whenever he calls, we know it's safe to come running. cool wee story. The sheep listen to the shepherd's voice, or do they? That's the big question. Lucy's just texted in or messaged in say that she thinks that they listen. Well, let's watch another short video that hopefully will answer that question. Do sheep really listen to their shepherd's voice? One more time. Oh my God, this is amazing. 
So there we go. Sheep really do listen to the shepherd's voice. We just saw it there. I think that's amazing. And that's what Jesus wants us to be like with him, to listen to his voice. How do we do that? Well, it's learning about his stories. Like, for example, a couple of weeks ago, we saw that Jesus didn't like that angry mob bullying the, lead, the, the woman. And we learned that. And that's really, really important. And if we listen to Jesus' voice, then we would stop ourselves doing that, wouldn't we? And Jesus, you see him being incredibly kind to people all the way through. But other times, he can get angry about stuff because he sees other people doing wrong and hurting people. And he always stands up to those situations. And so we learn about Jesus. We read about him in the Bible. And the more that we know about the stories and how, how, how he lived, the more we can base our lives on him by praying to him, by praying, Lord Jesus, show me how to live my life. That's how we listen to his voice. And it is just this amazing thing when we do. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you that you tell us to listen to your voice. And thank you for the sound of that voice. How wonderful it is. And help us in our lives that you would show us and you would call us and that we would learn to follow you. You are the good shepherd and we love you for that. Amen. Now, Ben and I have a special treat for you um, coming up. If you Yes, I now have my mic on. <laughs> so every time we talk about God or Jesus in this, we go, Baba, he's the good shepherd, and we point up the words. And then there's a lot of things in the song where it says, and I will follow him, and we do that. And the rest of it is we just will follow Ben and I because we're going to be so coordinated that that will be really easy. Let's enjoy, let's enjoy Ba ba, he's the good shepherd. On your feet now. Ba ba, he's the good shepherd. Everywhere I go, he knows. Ba ba, he is my savior. I will follow where he goes. Jesus loves. Watches, saves me, leads back home. Baba, he's the good shepherd. Everywhere I go, he knows. Baba, he is my savior. I will follow where he goes. I was so lost. Where do I begin? Good 
shepherd everywhere I go he knows Baba he is my savior I will follow where he goes I was so scared storms would frighten me I will not fear he's with me High five, I think. I think Britain, next stop, Britain's got talent. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> anyway, brilliant. I hope you enjoyed that in some form or other. Um, one, last, one last thing to say, or etc., is today it's somebody's birthday. Rory Eustace. You are five today. Amazing. Imagine being five. Five is so old. It's so big. It's amazing. Well done, and I hope you have a fabulous day with Emily and Hazel and David. Enjoy your birthday, Rory. Brilliant. Really enjoy it. Just some, some notices or, or just things to do here. Please, if you, if, you feel, if you feel able to do so, join us uh, for a cuppa after the service on Zoom. Um, just chat, we move into breakout rooms, and the link for that, if you are interested in it, is in the blurb on, um, I think, on Facebook and also um, on YouTube. But the information will be up at the end of the service as well, if you want to note that down. We've also got a new facility of folk being able to text in prayers. So, if you, if you text the, this number, um, 8228, and include as a first word, ask, in the text, you can either do that anonymously or add your name. It's a number that you could pass on to a friend, um, etc. If they wanted someone to pray for them, it is such an amazing thing to do when, as God's people, we pray for others who need God's blessing in their lives. Um, and this is just a way of doing that um, within the church. So please feel free to, to make use of that or to pass that on to, to, to someone else um, if, if you think it could be important for them. Um, we're trying to do more on YouTube, so if you want to keep up to date when we're, when we're doing that, there is a wee, in most, for most of your screens, there's a wee um, button in the bottom right, down there somewhere, um, which says subscribe, and that kind of puts you, um, it, it's, it's worth doing if you want to be informed about what's happening um, on, on YouTube. Um, and now we've, we've, in the background, and it's probably, been, it's probably been a bit hidden because of COVID, et cetera. But we have changed, um, we've changed the, the, the way that the session works and in, in the church. And there are now um, seven members of the Kirk session. But the idea is that people serve three-year terms and then they come off, off the Kirk session and a couple of new folk come on. And it's a huge pleasure to say that Bob is now going to introduce um, introduce two two of our prospective new elders and produce something that we we need to do within the Church of Scotland an edict or something quite formal um, about that process. We hope that, um, that that there may be the the ordination of these new elders towards the end of the month. But over now to Bob to introduce this. Well, good morning, everyone, and this is. Uh this is your virtual session, Clark here, uh, and this is uh, take number 25, could I say. You may recall that in our autumn 2020, in the Bulljaffrey Bulletin, the Kirk session asked you to give uh, real thought and prayer about people you feel God might be calling to serve on the session. At this time, we were seeking to appoint two new trusty elders, to replace Joyce McNay and Evelyn Hart, who were due to stand down from their roles within the Kirk session. 
At this time, we propose to do this by inviting you to bring forward names of people you believe have the gifts to serve the church by becoming members of the Kirk Session. Your response was encouraging and after some in-house training, prayer and discernment by those you suggested, I have great pleasure in telling you we have two members of our congregation who have been chosen by you and the Kirk Session to continue on their journey towards ordination. They are Pamela Graham and Katie Hart. Church law requires me to read out the following edict over the next two Sundays, so just bear with me. I'm just now going into my uh, I am jolly mode. Edict for ordination and admission of elders. Katie Hart and Pam Graham, members of this congregation, have been elected to be ruling elders and the Kirk Session has judged them to be qualified for that office and has sustained their election. Katie Hart and Pam Graham have accepted office as elders. If anyone has any objections why any of these members should not be ordained to office, they state their objection at the meeting of the Kirk Session by means of a Zoom conference call on Wednesday, 24th of March at half past 7 p.m. If no relevant objection regarding life or doctrine is made and substantiated, the Kirk Session will proceed to the ordination by order of the Kirk Session. With regards to that, uh, please uh, make contact with me at um, the following email, SC, which stands for Session Clark, it's just the letters, SC. Well, good morning, everyone, and this is... Brilliant. Thank you, Bob. Um, thank you very much for, for that. Um, I think it's a brilliant and amazing thing. And please pray for Pamela and Katie in the, the weeks ahead um, as they prepare for this moment. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful moment. Um, one last thing. We are, um, we, we've produced a series of congregational letters during lockdown, and there's been a flurry of them lately. If you would like to receive them and are not receiving them, most folk are getting them on email. Um, but if you haven't been receiving them and would like to, could you just drop me an email um, and we'll sort it out or, or a phone call and we'll sort something out. Um, it's just uh, it's to, to let you know what's happening. Um, and if you've been missing out on it for whatever reason, um, could be a change of email address or something like that, drop me an email. I'm McEwen at churchofscotland.org.uk or give me a phone and we will sort that out. It's an it's a important means of communication um, just now to let, to let folk know what is, what is going on. Let's now listen to God's Word and the reading from John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 11 to 21. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are also not of this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They too will listen unto my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own, of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, he is a demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, 
These are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of a blind? Yeah, as Linda just said in the text, fabulous reading. That was Lucy Joyce Hart's granddaughter from reading from East Craigtown Farm um, on Friday. I think during lockdown, many of us have learned the importance of celebrating the little things. And one of the little things I celebrated last summer was the discovery of this wonderful walk up a place called Lang Craigs in Dumbarton. You drive up this wee single track road near the BP petrol station in Milton, just as you come into to Dumbarton. And at the top of the road, up the hill, you find this incredible gothic-looking castle. There it is um, on the screen. And it turned out that this castle, you can picture in a Jane Austen-type way, the carriages with the flowing ball gowns arriving in under that, um, under that arch and whatever. Um, but I discovered, just because I'm interested in these things, I suppose, that this was Overton House, and it was the former home of someone called Lord Overton. And then you think, hmm, never heard of him, wonder what the story is. And it turned out that he was a very famous 19th century Christian philanthropist. He was one of the of the Labour Party fame. And the reason he fell out was that Keir Hardy wrote a, a paper or a pamphlet that exposed the workers' conditions at, o at Overton's chromium factory in the east end of Glasgow. Deep, deep burns from molten metal. I won't say any more than that. But in particular as well was the fact that Lord Overton refused, despite strenuous efforts for it, for it for, for it to, he refused to give the workers in his factory Sundays off for them to go to church and to rest and to be with their families. And when I discovered this story, I actually felt a bit gutted in a strange way. I began and I thought I was reading about a life, an admirable life, faithfully lived. And then when you discovered this thing that had gone on, with, with Keir Hardy, it all, the impressions of Lord Overton all fell apart. I couldn't reconcile myself to someone being the chair of the Lord's Day Observance Society and campaigning for the rights of workers to have a day off. Wonderful. But he similarly refused his own workers in his own factories their rights to rest and to worship on a Sunday. And that feeling is a timeless story. We've all encountered someone who presents in a certain way. And then over time, events reveal that they're not actually who they claim to be. We don't need to drill down very far in the contemporary world to find failures of leadership. Let's pause now and listen or sing along with the metrical version of Psalm 23. And if you want, use this time to ponder your thoughts on what makes for good leaders and good leadership, someone that you are willing to follow. We have a friend who is a teacher in a school a good distance away from here, and it has been a hard 12 months, as we all know, in schools. Huge levels of stress and angst and doing different and new things. But what always shines through when this friend talks about her school, is how her head teacher is so totally supportive and caring. I have never met this head teacher. In fact, I don't even know the person's name. But she is definitely a good leader, a good shepherd, the sort of person, when we encounter them, 
that we should thank God for and pray for more of them in our world, in all levels of society. Let's listen now to Psalm 23. And so in John chapter 10, we have this very clear and neat distinction between the good shepherd and the hired hand. The difference between them is that the shepherd cares for the sheep, while the hired hand only pretends to care for the sheep and will cut and run when trouble comes calling. The good shepherd is drawing on the Old Testament image of the shepherd king. It is most clearly um, clearly given to us in the form of King David, the shepherd boy who became king. But it goes far beyond David, as Ben spoke about at the beginning of the service. And it became this, ima this image for a righteous ruler, a good leader, and especially manifest in God's care for us. Listen now to this single verse from Psalm 100 
And as you listen to the words, the link between God and the shepherd is very, very clear. God is the shepherd. So when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, to a group of, 20 for, of, of first century Jews, he is not saying, I am a really kind person. He's not even saying, I am a very good leader. He's actually assimilating, taking upon himself an image that belongs to God. Jesus is, Jesus is saying, I am the ultimate shepherd king. David was the first shepherd king, but David failed in so many different ways. David was simply human. I am the good shepherd, the embodiment of that. And of course, when Jesus says that he lays down his life, ultimately he is pointing towards the cross. Verse 17 in John 10, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. And as we approach Easter, it's Easter in Easter Sunday in a month's time, we sing words like, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my riches gain, I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did our such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Love and leadership, as described in that hymn, are compelling. I find these words about sacrifice always move me when we've sung them together as a congregation. There is a raw purity to it. And the word that John uses for good can also be translated as beautiful. I am the beautiful shepherd. Obviously, this is not a reference to how Jesus looked. Rather, it's about the sheer attractiveness, the drawing power as the, as the shepherd when Jesus calls, people want to come. I often think the church gets in the way of this, sadly. More on that in a minute. In this life of Jesus, in this story, we encounter a truth, a beauty that cuts right through the frustrations and pain of being betrayed by the hired hands of this life. Jesus dying on the cross is not an arbitrary event. It really is the signature, the confirmation that he is for you in a way that no one else can be or ever will be. The point of calling Jesus the good shepherd is to state the strange, compelling power of love that draws us to the one who gave his life. But let's not stop here because we have jumped something very significant in the passage that Lucy read for us. In verse 16, Jesus says, I have other sheep that are not of this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus is talking about his message, his sacrifice, not just being for the Jews, but it being for the Gentiles, the outsiders as well. In effect, here we have Jesus in verse 16 of John chapter 10 anticipating the book of Acts and the grand rollout 
of the church into Jerusalem and Samaria and into all the world. A former Archbishop of Canterbury called William Temple is credited with saying this, the church is the only organization in the world that exists for the benefit of its non-members. The church is the only organization in the world that exists entirely for the benefit of its non-members. What do you think about that statement? I really wish we could now break into discussion groups and chat about it. It connects with Jesus' words in verse 16 about this outward vision, this desire to reach those sheep not already in the fold. And here is another pithy saying. It might be a little more familiar to us. I am the church. You are the church. We are the church together. I hope one of the great and long-lasting lessons that we are learning over the last horrible long year is that as that song goes, the church is not a building. It is not an organization. It is not an institution. It is the people. I am the church. You are the church. And if the church is to fulfill the great commission to bring the gospel to the world, if it is to honor Jesus' vision of calling new sheep into the care of the good shepherd, then it will only be done through you. And if it isn't done through you, it will not be done at all. And if the immediacy of that thought worries or perhaps even terrifies you, then get back to the queue. Get to the back of the queue. You'll be behind me. We don't like the word evangelism. We would feel much more comfortable, many of us, in a church that exists for the benefit of its members, the opposite of what William Temple says. But if I am the church and you are the church and we are the church together, then the great vision of Jesus reaching new sheep needs to happen through us. And if that's so, I leave you with this question. Who is the shepherd calling you to reach out to? Pray for them. Bring your love for that person to God and make blessing them and sharing with them a priority. I don't mean, I don't mean preach it hard and, 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 and Bible bashing. That's not what's meant here. But it's simply realizing that the ultimate gift that we can ever give to somebody is to share the life of Jesus with them. In John 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I have come to bring life to you, life in all its fullness. What a gift. And you never know, when we start blessing others, you might just love them into the kingdom. So much more needs to be said on this in the life of our church. But for now, let's listen to the hymn, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say, and I invite you to reflect on who it might be that Jesus is calling you to bless and who might hear his voice through the blessing that you bring into their lives. And as we listen to this hymn, we'll open up the social wedge. And if you want to pray into that space or make any comment on it, please go ahead and do that. I heard the voice of Jesus say,
I'm going to pray, and again, if you want to add in your own prayers, there will be a time of, of silence in the prayer, but if you want to add in your own prayers and share them with others, then please feel free to use the, the, the social wedge to do that. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, good shepherd, thank you for that. Thank you for your word. And in, in you, we have someone that we can look to, someone that we can follow with total confidence. Lord, heal us. Heal this word, world from the damage that hired hands do when they take up positions of leadership on a basis that they are uncommitted. While pretending to be this, they are actually something else. And Lord, thank you. When we have met and encountered people who model, embody in themselves and the way they are, committed leadership. Lord, we long for it. It is like water in a thirsty land. And we pray this all across the world, that you would bring forward leaders who are willing to put themselves second and those who follow them first. in business, in education, in health, in politics. We pray this, Lord. We also, Lord, acknowledge the sadness, the listlessness, and the despair that is around us just now in the eyes and the words and the demeanor of so many. Lord, we are tired. We pray, Lord, for folk who have lost a loved one over the last year, and for whom that process of grieving, of saying farewell, of having not spent adequate time with them beforehand, has just exacerbated the pain of loss. Good Shepherd, may all those folk who carry that pain and that loss intensified by this last year feel your healing touch now. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling because of things like not experiencing the touch of another human being for so long, for meeting elderly parents or behind a, behind a glass screen, or for not being able to hug grandchildren or meet with them or travel to see them. We pray for those, Lord, who are longing for a holiday. We pray, Lord, for young people who feel in so many ways a sense of despair or pain over huge issues like the economy, job prospects. Will they ever be able to afford a home a house for themselves, and not to mention things like climate change. Lord, we pray for that generation and ask, Lord, that you would help your church speak into that situation with tenderness, kindness, and relevance. And forgive us when we have failed to do that. Lord, we now bring our own prayers to you just now. And in this moment of quiet and silence, we have space to lament. We have space to pray for the blessing on others that we know of. Lord,
Lord, hear our prayers as we bring them to you now. Loving God, take our sorrow, our sadness, our pain, our lament, and bring us to a place of comfort and hope. And as we open our eyes, Lord, we pray in the theme of last week's service that we will see clearly now that you are the good shepherd. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining this service of worship this morning. I hope you have heard the voice of Jesus in some way call you or prompt you or lead you. May God bless you and keep you. We finish our worship with the song, The King of Love, My Shepherd Is. Mm -hmm.